and welcome to our Sunday worship at Unity Presbyterian Church. We have a couple of announcements this morning. First, you need to know that due to the Franklin County moving us to a level three red, the COVID phase, session has determined that we should go back to our former position of no in building meetings, even in small groups. So if your committee or group has had Perfect. All right. How about now? So if your committee or group has had an in-house meeting scheduled, please make other arrangements. If you have brought an offering with you this morning, we have placed the wishing well along the sidewalk for you to place your envelopes in there. This is Pastor Steve's inaugural sermon as our transitional pastor. And we want to invite you to take a minute after this morning's worship service to greet him and have a treat as well. You will find a table over outside shortly. And after the service, have some goodies and introduce yourself. It will not be a drive over or drive through. It will open. So we don't have to worry about that. As pointed out in the newsletter earlier, we have pictures and thank you notes from the Ludwig family on the picnic table. If you notice, I'm wearing a, yeah, yeah. a Halloween tie, and that's to remind you the, uh, of the trick-or-treat uh, drive-up, and they're accepting donations. There's a box on the porch coming into the church. Now let us prepare our hearts and our minds for worship.
exalt the Almighty and worship at God's holy mountain. For the Lord our God is holy. Look, the Lord draws near. Come into the presence of the Holy One. Let us behold the glory of our God. so loved the world that he gave his only son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. Trusting in God's grace, let us speak the truth about ourselves as together we confess our sin. Let us pray. Living Lord, in you we live and move and have our being. You call us to give all that we are and all that we have in service to Christ, but we hold tightly to our treasure, afraid we will not have enough for ourselves, and hold back our talents, afraid these gifts will not be enough. God, unclench our fists and help us to give fully and freely, so that in all things we might serve and glorify you. Amen. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, in order that you may proclaim the mighty acts of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Now, having received the peace of Christ's forgiveness, let us extend the peace of Christ to one another. May the peace of Christ be with you. I invite you to extend to one another the fist bump of friendship.
by the spirit of truth to hear the word of life you speak and to give all glory, honor, and praise to your threefold name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Our New Testament reading this morning comes from the book of Revelation in the third chapter, beginning at the seventh verse. Listen for the word of God. To the angel of the church in Philadelphia, write, these are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. I will make those who are the synagogue of Satan, who claim to be Jews though they are not, but are liars, I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. Since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole earth to test the inhabitants of the earth. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. The one who is victorious, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will they leave it. I will write on them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God. And I will also write on them my new name. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This is the word of the Lord. I'm so pleased that I have been invited to serve as your transitional pastor, and together we will travel through the wilderness of uncertainty and promise which comes during this transitional period in the life of any church. And at the same time, we are traveling through the wilderness of uncertainty with the COVID pandemic. Here we are worshiping outside. Again, it is a dry day, but it may be a bit chilly. So I'm wondering how many of you have attended a high school football game on a Friday night under the lights? Let's see the hands. Okay, well, that's not nearly as warming as a morning in worship together in fellowship. And if you think my sermon's long, remember how long the second half is at those chilly Friday night football games. Please pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Three of our young people, Alyssa, Lucy, and Sydney, have embarked upon the journey to confirmation of the baptismal vows made on their behalf. One of them will receive believer's baptism, having not been baptized when she was young. And they are under the leadership of Dan Jacks and Barb Edwards as well as a number of mentors who will be guiding them in their journey to claiming the Christian faith as their own. Years ago, when I taught my very first confirmation class, I thought, how can I simplify this experience for these young people so they can grasp it at a young age? 
and I pose to them three questions. First, who is Jesus Christ? Second, what is the church? Third, what are you going to do about it? So you can well imagine how Alyssa and Lucy and Sydney are asking, what is the church? And how can I know? And truth be told, you and I often wrestle with that question as well. In this time of the COVID pandemic, many of us are finding ourselves moving into uncharted territory and discovering new ways to be the church when so often we need to be physically separated while we are able to be one in the spirit. I once served a church about 200 yards from a railroad track. Every now and then we had to stop the service to let the train whistle stop. All right, well, let us continue anyway. I hope you can hear me over the roar. Think about what the secular world thinks about the church. What do the people on the street think about the church? What is the true church and how can we know? Is the true church Joel Osteen or Joyce Myers or Carl Stanley or the many who broadcast over the television? And these days, many churches are live streaming their worship, as my last church did. And you have your YouTube services for those who are not able to come and join us here on the lawn. How do we know what the true church is? Well, John, in the book of Revelation, gives us some insight as he speaks the words of Jesus' spirit to the church. The church, with all its shapes and forms, all its flaws and imperfections, it seems to defy human description. It's a bewildering array, a kaleidoscope of different images. But the writer of the book of Revelation was asking the same question. What is the true church, and how can we know? He wrote, to churches in Asia Minor, and this was during a time when they were suffering great persecution at the hands of the Romans. And the question he posed to them was whether they would submit to the claims of the pagan world or the powers of Christianity. Would they yield to Caesar or to Christ? To one church at Laodicea, the spirit wrote, I know your words, you are neither cold nor hot, so because you are lukewarm, I will spew you out of my mouth. You see, neither hot enthusiasm nor cold antagonism marked this church's life. Instead, they were possessed by a lukewarm spirit in all matters of the spirit. So the writer of the book of Revelation knew that the surest road to ruin for any church is that certain self-satisfied complacency. But to another church, the church of Philadelphia, he wrote a very different sort of letter. To them he wrote, Behold, I have set before you an open door. You have but little power. And yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name the Church of Philadelphia had found her life and faithfulness to her Lord, and as a result, set before them was an open door to the future. These letters to the two churches at Laodicea and Philadelphia and to the five other churches have a contemporary ring, haven't they? Over the past several decades, we have seen one church after another closed its doors for the final time, and yet other churches seem to thrive. What is the difference? Let us examine the marks of the authentic church. First, an authentic church is a congregation of worshipers 
Think about it for a moment, and you will see that worship is the one unique and defining act of the Christian. We do many things as the church. We study and learn to grow in our faith, but there are many out in the secular world who study and learn and grow. As the church, we come together in fellowship, but in the secular world, many people gather together in friendship and fellowship in different fraternal and sororal organizations. In the church, we know that we are sent to serve the needs of the needy. But the secular world as well has many service organizations who reach out to those in need. So you can see how being a congregation of worshipers is the one unique defining act. All the other things we do as the church are on a horizontal plane, but when we worship, we find ourselves in a vertical plane, moving toward the transcendent, the human and the holy connecting, the transient and the eternal uniting and we connect with God, our source. Think of it this way. Each of us is a part of a family, or has been, and each day we go on our appointed rounds. One goes to work and another goes to school. One goes to the market, another goes to the, a meeting. One may go to a museum and the other to the orchestra. But we always come home, don't we? We come home to those with whom we are closest. We share our love. And when we come together for worship, it is just like that. When we come together as the church to worship Almighty God, we are not coming to a place, we are coming to a people. The word church comes from the Greek word ekklesia, which means the gathered ones or an assembly. And in the New Testament, it is always followed by the prepositional phrase to theo, which means of God. So we are the gathered ones of God and we come together to worship God and to connect with our source. Someone once remarked that we become like that which we love. How marvelous to think that when we worship God, our spirits begin to become more like the divine. Our worship is a gift which is pleasing to God. To worship God is to know his pleasure. To worship God is to enjoy him. Some of the older ones among you may remember the Westminster Shorter Catechism, which used to be taught in Sunday school in the early decades of the last century. And of those 107 short questions and answers, the first one asked this question, what is man's chief end? What is woman's chief end? And the reply in the Westminster Shorter Catechism states, man's chief end is to glorify God. Now, we adults are often pretty demonstrative about glorifying God, but we would do well for our young people if we taught them the second half of that answer. Man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. Are you enjoying God? Centuries ago, Gothic cathedrals dominated the ermine centers of Europe. A large cathedral stood at the center of a town's life, its worship, its learning, its art, its culture. It was a gathering place of the people, its massive foundation resting firmly on the ground and its soaring buttresses rising heavenward. Worship in these cathedrals became the intersection of the earthly and the eternal, the human and the divine. Human hearts and God's hearts, human thoughts and God's thoughts. When we worship, we remember our roots and we are reminded of our future 
as God's children. We thank God that whether on earth or eternally in the heavens, we live with God's companionship and care. Now, the central place of worship may be obvious to you and me, but so much threatens our participation in regular worship. Some misguided souls insist that they do not need the church to worship God. And true as that may be, they miss the point. It is not simply about communing with God. It is about being drawn together in community, as is God's will for us. There is a reason why the Lord's Prayer begins, Our Father who art in heaven, not my Father. The experience may be personal, but it is not meant to be private. And we come together for worship, not to see what we can get out of it, but for what we can put into it. The word liturgy literally means work. What we can give to God and to one another. Remind me to bring a paperweight next time. And this private religion may be bad enough, but think about all the ways we have to deal with our busy on-the-go culture. Think about all of the excuses that can be invented for every Sunday of the year. I don't have to tell you, you already know them, but let me remind you, weekend house guests, weekend sports events, recreation, a trip to the lake, a trip to the city or the museum, bad weather, and my favorite, good weather. You and I may think Eric Little, the Olympic runner featured in the 1984 award-winning movie Chariots of Fire to be something of a quite anachronism and a bit puritanical when he refused to run the 100-meter race at the 1924 Paris Olympics because the race fell on the Sabbath. But still, his example reminds us that how much we have lost our devotion and how much worship has lost its place in our modern world. One of my confirmation students years ago wrote in her statement of faith, if you are going to follow God, you must make some commitment the church is God's home. If you want God to come to your home, you must go to his. So an authentic church will be the church of the open door, which draws people into the visible act of community worship. The authentic church is a congregation of worshipers. Second, the authentic church is a college of disciples we know the church cannot survive unless we produce mature Christians, unless we are a school, a training ground for followers of Jesus Christ, a community which make disciples for Christ. You have often heard the saying, I imagine, that the church is only one generation away from extinction. That may be bad theology because it does not acknowledge the sovereignty of God and how God's will will not be thwarted. But still, we recognize if we do not teach this faith to our children, there will be no church of the future. We will follow then the fate of the church of Laodicea. And fortunately, we are a cause of disciples here at the Unity Presbyterian Church. We have our confirmation leaders. We have our Sunday school leaders. We have our youth leaders. And many of you participate in Bible study or one of our small groups. Our efforts to pass on the Christian faith to future generations can run into great obstacles. We are living in a generation of biblical illiterates. How many of us can claim that we know the Christian faith as well as our parents or our grandparents did? How many of us are living a secondhand faith passed on by previous generations? 
not a faith which has been forged on the anvil of our own experience. Have you ever considered that you might be a better person if you were able to more closely follow the example of Christ? The study of scripture is your opportunity to look, as it were, into a mirror and see your own life reflected and discover the power of Christ to transform our lives in ways little and large. The first church I served in Bryn Mawr, Pennsylvania was a large congregation of 3,600. The sanctuary was a beautiful, large, Gothic sanctuary constructed around World War I. Many years later, at a Princeton Seminary book club, I met a retired missionary named Park Johnson, and he explained to me how he had visited that church as a young man shortly after the sanctuary had been constructed. Seated in the last pew, he marveled at the immensity of the sanctuary and how many hundreds of people were gathered there. After the service, he inquired of the church sexton. He said, I imagine it must be difficult for the preacher to be heard all the way in the back pew. The sexton smiled and replied, why no, not at all. Why this church has excellent agnostic qualities. Fortunately, the sexton had confused his words. He didn't mean to say agnostic, he meant to say acoustic. And what a good thing it is for us to know that we do not have excellent agnostic qualities here. We are a people who are moving toward a bold faith. The Church of Philadelphia was commended because they followed Christ and kept his word, because they knew his word. The Church of the Open Door is that church which opens its way to the truth of the Bible and informs the faith of our believers. The Authentic Church is a college of disciples. Third, the Authentic Church is a community of friends. Jesus said, a new commandment I give unto you, to love one another. He wants us to be friends and care for one another. I know that runs counter to our society, which applauds the rugged individualist. Some of us like to think of ourselves as self-made people, dependent upon no one, paying our own way, calling our own shots, carrying our own burdens. But no matter who we are, there comes a time in life when we just cannot make it on our own. The hospital patient who faces major surgery or a long illness. The COVID patient wondering where they will fall in the statistics column. The unemployed provider the family who grieve the death of a loved one, perhaps to COVID, and those who have lost a loved one to addiction or suicide, the estranged marriage partners, the concerned parent, the confused teenager, the lonely child. These are the 